So yes, uh, I got this for our D&D encounter on Sunday. I've been wanting to paint it for ages. I'm really excited. Yeah, oh my God, that's so cool. I really want to paint a big dragon like this on the channel. Yeah, yeah that's so really good. fun. Um, let's get some lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sick. So that's the adult green. What, what, which ones haven't they made? Uh, they've only done two of the gem dragons and I don't think a lot of them. Sponsored by Dragon Trappers Lodge. Hello. Hello there. So I have my Nolza's dragon here. It's a green dragon and this thing is pretty big. It's like the size of my head. So we're gonna unbox this uh, and have a little look and see at the quality and just how big the actual dragon is inside this box. Oh, okay, well, that was easy. Yeet. Here is the dragon all unboxed and ready to go. And there's a couple of things that I've noticed. The tail doesn't fit on 100%. I'm gonna have to go and start carving it out a little bit. And then I'm probably gonna super glue it on because there's no reason for them to be in separate parts. But I'm a little bit bummed that I have to go and do that. You'd think for a model that's at the price point it is that you would be able just to shove it straight on. Also the base isn't 100% stuck on either. So I'm gonna have to super glue that so then it's completely in place. But that I do understand because then I can paint it separately. So that kind of makes sense. I'm a little bit bummed about the tail. I was also a little bit worried because I thought I would have to clean up a fair amount of flash. Some of the other Nolz's minis have quite a bit of flash and line molds on them. This is actually pretty okay. Hey, I probably will have to remove some line molds. I need to have a really good look at it. Other than that, I did expect a little bit of cleanup, so we'll see how we go. Other than that, it also does say it's already primed, but I don't know how much I trust that. And so I am going to prime it first, probably in white before I start putting on any type of paint. I just don't know what type of primer they've used. And I just really want to prime it a second time just to make sure the paint stays on because it's going to be handled quite a lot in a D&D game. So with all that said and done, uh, let's clean him up a little bit, prime him, and then we can add some color and we can get started. <laughs> My dragon! Yes, this is a huge dragon and I was a little bit sorry to be taking this away from you, but uh, I'm also really excited. Let's be honest, you've seen my mini backlog. There is no way I was actually gonna get to paint this in time for our D&D encounter. So I'm uh, low key uh, glad you're painting it as much as I'm sad I don't get to. So to start things off, I needed to put the model together. And well, it was pretty much all together except for the tail and the tail didn't fit on in the night way. Had to carve a little bit of it off just so it would sit nicely. Even then I knew I'd have to do some gap filling. The one thing I actually don't like about this model is the fact that it comes fully assembled. This means that I can't paint the wings separately and it's going to be really difficult to get into all those little nooks and crannies. The way the wings are posed is really interesting. You don't often see dragons posed with their wings at the zenith of the flap. However, for a painter, I'm just looking at this gap in between and thinking how on earth are you going to paint the backside of each wing well? That's that's a great question, Dave. I have no idea. And I'm gonna be using the airbrush to lay down a lot of the color. So hopefully we can try and get it in between the wings somehow. So for a supposedly pre-primed and ready to paint out of the box model, I'm seeing a lot of carving with a hobby knife. This particular model and some of the other Nolz's minis I've worked with before do tend to have a lot of flash and some mold lines as well. So I need to go around to make sure it was nice and smooth. This kind of detracts from the whole pre-primed and ready to paint thing because any areas that you clean up in this way, you're going to have to reprime, right? Exactly. So although this model had a few cleanup issues, carving off the mold lines was actually a bit of a breeze. The plastic that they used does slice through quite easily. It's kind of like going through butter. Like any model that you would be doing any prep work with, you want to make sure that you're sanding it down afterwards. So I got a heavy duty sander for this model and gave him a good scrubber dub. So as I mentioned before, I used Milliput to do my gap filling in this project and I am super happy with how this turned out. It was just a normal mixture of Milliput with a bit of isopropyl alcohol to help smooth everything together. There were no lumps, everything was nice and smooth and using the ISO allowed me to even get into the little nooks and crannies to really make sure that it was all completely covered. The biggest 
gap I had to fill was definitely in between his tail and it was looking a little odd, but I knew with this method I could try and imitate the scales that were already there so it would look seamless. And after waiting four hours for everything to cure, it was time to prime this bad boy up. Hey Dave, do you love dragons? I love dragons. And so does our sponsor Dragon Trappers Lodge today, an amazing Patreon creating 3D printed miniatures for your tabletop war games and RPGs. There are a lot of companies producing miniatures out there in the world these days, but Dragon Trappers Lodge is truly one of the exceptional ones. They're one of the ones where every month their awesome, unique themes catch my eye with the right blend of great models, originality, and interesting concepts. With the diverse range of models, you you can find something for your tabletop. They also come in different sizes so you can scale them however you wish. Every month they release two different tiers, one catering more towards RPG players with 5e compatible rules and another tier with a whole different range of models catering towards war gamers with rules compatible with one page rules. Each of these tiers is only $12 and you can combine them both and get all the models and the rules for only $18 a month. This month's release is the Darkwood featuring some of your favorite mythical creatures with a dark twist to them. And you better believe there's some cool dragons in this release too. If you like Dryads, Ents, and Treeple, this is an amazing release. And the Fae-like Dryad Dragon is awesome. I absolutely love this model. It's a great centerpiece. And the RPG collection this month, Monsters of the Multiverse, are just bizarre, and I love it. If you want some interesting creatures and encounters that'll really make your tabletop players go, what? Uh, this is the month's collection for you. Other companies don't bother to test print their miniatures, but Dragon Trappers Lodge do. This ensures you get a good quality print every time. They're all pre-supported and test printed printed to make sure it's as easy as possible for you to get these minis on your tabletop. So whether you're an avid 3D printer or you're a DM looking to get some new models, be sure to check them out. All of the links are down in the description below and thank you so much for being sponsored for today's video. DRAGONS! Mari said that, it sounded fun. DRAGONS! DRAGONS! Huge thank you to all of the people who recommended this method in uh, the last video that I did. I've actually kind of fallen in love with this technique. I think that using the Millie putt and the ISO to like smooth it out causes kind of like a liquid green stuff equivalent, but it kind of works a lot better. So I'm really happy with that. So I've got to wait four hours for that to set. So in the meantime, I'm going to move on to the base and start doing some really cool stuff to this, creating sort of like a forest uh, or a jungle environment on this. There are different rings that indicate the different size that you can use to so an adult and a gargantuan dragon. But I'm just gonna cover this for the sake of just D&D &D funness. Uh, I don't think size is an incredibly important thing when it comes to D&D. &D, so I'm just gonna make a really cool base for it and experiment with a couple of different things. I still have to sort of sand down the dragon still, but I'm gonna wait till the milli parts dry before I touch that. So let's move on to basing, one of my favorite parts of the hobby. Ah! Whoa, whoa, whoa. As your GM, I just heard you say that basing and the size of the base is not that important in D&D. I mean, I play as a player. I'm never a DM, so... Yeah, no, I'm going to be honest. I've DM'd for many years and it really isn't. Once you get to uh, huge and gigantic, it's the base is already really big. And when you're fighting something like a dragon, it's going to be moving around. It's not that important. The whole party is going to be able to get in base contact with it. I don't... It doesn't matter. I don't mind. I had some pretty cool ideas that if I did want to keep the different sizes I could definitely make it work maybe I made a pool in the middle and grass on the outside but I really wanted to create a rich and full environment so I covered the entire thing I like it this way I'm glad you did it this way and as the DM who's going to be using this dragon that just means I can use it as an adult or an ancient dragon whenever I want so to kick things off I grabbed a couple of these rocks that we had been given from gamers grass these were small enough that I thought would work really well on this base once they were all glued down and dried I decided I wanted to put a little pond somewhere on my base so I mapped this out by using some smaller rocks, again with some super glue, and waited for that to dry. Next up was covering this entire thing in some texture paste. And we have this new one from Vallejo that I'm actually a pretty big fan of. It kind of reminds me of a texture modeling paste. It doesn't have a whole lot of, well, texture in it, but you can add stuff in later if you want to. It also gave this sort of velvet look to the rocks, and I actually really like this effect. I think it's really cool. The lack of thick or large pieces of grit and texture in this paste makes it really good for blending things seamlessly onto a base because when it runs over onto the edge of some resin, for example, it doesn't leave all these lumpy, chunky bits that just look stuck on and out of place. However, if you want that texture, as Jen mentioned, you just add it into the mix. It also ends up dried at the top of the lid too, the, the chunky bits, and it's really disgusting. So I'm hoping this doesn't do that. Once everything was dry, I went over the top with a dark brown color just for the earth and then went in with a deep blue for my little pond. My little pond. Do you get it? It's pony. My Little pond. Pony. Yeah. 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 That's the sum total of everything I know about My Little Pony. Oh. Except Black Templars don't like them. <laughs> 
everything was dry, I went over the top with a khaki colored paint just as a dry brush on top. Again, really showing those textures and that sort of velvety look that I really like on this base. After that was all done, I moved on to my pond and decided to use UV resin to give it that nice liquidy effect. And don't worry, it was UV resin, not depor resin. I'm going back to basics here after our uh, mishap last time. I find UV resin is really good for tiny pores and can give a really good effect. I will give a small word of warning when using uh, UV resin. So one of the minor things that can happen with UV resin is when it cures, it kind of curls up at the edges and peels up from the base, which can lead to these areas where they don't actually look like a pond of water. It's almost like a droplet of water with surface tension on it. A couple of really good ways to fix this is to use a water effects paste from a company like Woodland Scenics and just dab that around the edges to blend it in more perfectly. Or in my case, I knew I'd be adding in a bunch of plants so I could cover those seams if I needed to. Speaking about plants, it was time to add some greenery onto this base. And if I've learned anything from the table builds and the various bases I've made, it's to use a collection of different types of grass and shrubbery. This kind of gives a more natural ecosystem and it's a lot of fun just putting these wherever I feel like they needed to be. Plants! Yes, something else I also love to add is, is some of these laser cut plants, again, from Gamers Grass. These are so much fun to make and I added in a couple of different types, again, just to show a really diverse ecosystem. I gotta say, Jen, this is looking really fantastic. I love this for a green dragon, which for those who play D&D know, lives in the forest. Yeah, I'm really happy with how this base turned out, and I even added in just a couple little flowers on top of the pond, which I think looks super cute. Puddle. <laughs> Spring. Yeah, it really is a puddle. It's a puddle, dragon. let's be honest. <laughs> Wow, this barely fits in the spray booth, Jen. Oh. What's going on? Oh my God, it, it didn't fit in the spray booth at all. This was an absolute nightmare to try and spray. And unfortunately it was raining outside and I couldn't use the warehouse. So it had to go in the spray booth. Again, this was the downside of it being fully built and me not being able to make it modular. If I was able to spray these wings separately, I would have had a way easier time, but I tried my best nevertheless. So as you might've guessed, a green dragon is, well, green. So I was going to be basing it in a bunch of green hues. But to start things off, I did start with a brown. I wanted to incorporate more of a yellowy green. And as everyone knows, yellow onto black does not work. You need to put down a brown first. So starting off with a brown airbrush, I went into the more leathery parts of the wings and added this color here. Once that was dried, I went over the top with a darker green on most of the dragon. I then went back and forth with various greens just to build up those colors where the light was hitting it or where there was a particular different patch of skin. And after tackling with this beast for a good hour, I decided I'd had enough and it was time to move on to hand painting. So when the Squidmar boys came down to the studio, there's something that I noticed in their painting technique that I kind of wanted to try for myself. After they'd laid down their airbrushed colors, they used really strong pigmented and saturated colors on top. And I thought that this created a really cool effect. I also tend to have a more painterly style when I paint my bigger miniatures. So I wanted to incorporate that here. So starting off with a skin colored, I wanted to sort of paint in the recesses of the wings. Again, the wings being the biggest part of the model and also the focal point. So I gave them a pink wash just to make them look a bit raw and fleshy. So for anyone that's painted a dragon before, they probably know the pain of painting every scale. And this dragon was no exception. Starting off with his underbelly, I went around and started line highlighting all of the edges of the scales and adding in those little fine lines that you see as well. I've painted a star drake and I did like a four step layering on every single scale. It basically drove me insane and made me stop painting Stormcast Eternals for a full year. Yeah, I'm not going to that extreme. I remember that pain. Mine's very much just a plain old line highlight. This dragon did have a lot of texture on it, especially here in his neck. I was able just to dry brush this on really lightly and it came out really nice. So one of the last things I needed to do was decide what color I wanted to paint his main scales and everything was looking very bright and colorful, but I had an idea of something that I wanted to do and I needed to paint this black before I could get started. So I am all done with my base for now. It needs to dry for a little bit longer. So again, it's gonna be a couple of hours before I can touch it. But there's something I've been eyeing off for a little while and I think this might be a good video to maybe try it out. We have these color shift paints that have been sitting on this shelf here for a really long time and I have wanted to try them for the longest time. But I haven't really found a project where I felt like it would be cool or that the model would be big enough that they would sort of show off properly. 
And I mean, this dragon's pretty big, so it could work really, really well. And we do have one in particular that could be really good. It's this bright gold to brown color, which I think could look cool with the green, but I really don't want to put it on without doing an experiment first. So I'm gonna use one of these little rock bases and just prime him up in black. And then I'm gonna also see what it looks like on a green color. So I'm gonna paint half of a green, keep half of a black, and then spray the effect over the top. Let's see what it looks like. Could be really cool. So I am in the warehouse uh, because I need to do a little bit of airbrushing, but the studio is full of people at the moment and it's raining outside. So I've come into the warehouse just to do a really quick bit of airbrushing. And I'm going to do the color shift paints on the dragon. And I'm a little bit terrified, uh, but I did do a test swatch and I think I'm really happy with how it'll turn out. So I'm gonna go ahead and put on the color shift that we saw earlier on the dragon on the black areas. Um, I'm gonna try and film it. It might be horrible, let's give it a go. The moment of truth, Jen. Yes, it was time to savor those peelies and pull everything off and see how it had turned up. And I was pleasantly surprised. I'm actually really happy that I took the time to do this because I think it turned out really well. Yeah, it's certainly looking interesting at this point. I like the vibe, uh, but how are you going to make it feel a little bit more accurate to the hand painting on the lower parts? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So the first thing I wanted to do was try and separate some of those scales by black lining in between each of them. It took a little bit of time, but I think it made it well worth the effort. I also painted the fringe, so he's like top fringy bit in a different color as well to sort of distract from the chrome shift that was on his scales. Also quickly went around and did his little nails too, just to keep in theme with the other paint schemes I had used. Yeah, I think on an organic creature, it's really interesting to have uh, a color shift effect like this. I initially wasn't sure it would work, but after seeing the black lining and the separation of the different elements, it's turned out really cool. It's like these are the emerald scales on the hide of this dragon. This is definitely a paint I think needs to be used sparingly and not all over an entire model, just in certain areas. And with all the final colors done and all of my washes all dried up, it was time for the final reveal. Thank you so much to all of our patrons for your continued support and backing us to make these videos. We put out two videos a week, which is a huge amount of work. And as well as this, we'd love to be able to tackle bigger projects like the battle report. And the patrons are the way that happens. They require a whole bunch of editing time, extra hours and extra work. That's only made possible thanks to all of your support. You get awesome perks for signing up. So all of the links are down in the description below for you to check out. Jen, that dragon looks so good. I'm really jealous. You painted my dragon that I bought for my D, D campaign. Yeah, mm. I had a lot of fun painting it. I actually really like painting big models, so this was really, really cool. Ah. Yeah, jealousy is the word. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say uh, it really proves what I already thought. Knowles' minis, uh, they're decent for getting started, but they have a lot of problems with mold slippage, mold lines, and also the quality is kind of like okay. I do think that as we get to these bigger miniatures, they are kind of pushing it in terms of price. And with the quality of resin printing, I do think that these kind of models are in a lot of trouble because it's pretty static. Mm. Um, yeah, you can definitely get a dragon that's in like a really cool pose or you can change it to however you want. This is a very traditional dragon mm. uh, and you could get mm. some really cool ones online. Well, thank you to the sponsor of the video, Dragon Trappers Lodge. Uh, they actually produce a lot of dragon trapping themed content and a lot of other really cool models every month. And we're actually going to do a video where we 3D print and paint one of their cooler massive dragon models. That'll be really fun. Oh, who gets... Yeah. Dragons! I think Mari deserves that one, don't Dragons! you think? Dragons! Mari deserves the dragon. Dragons! Thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one. Dragons!